Once again, Christian greetings to all our valued listeners and viewers throughout the whole world, more particularly to all shepherds and believers, and most especially to our beloved brothers and sisters in the United States of America. Special greetings to our brethren on Colorado, in Fiji Island, Mexico, Spain, Africa, the United Kingdom, and also to our brethren in Australia. And to the 144,000 living saints scattered abroad, greetings, may the good Lord bless you, and have a wonderful evening. This is our episode number 9 on the subject, the wave ship and the wave loads. So let us read track number, number 3. Saying, those whose vision is clear on the fruit of the harvest, as taught in the testimonies of the prophets and in the parables, will have a still clearer vision as we study the significance of the wave ship, the wave loaves, and the feast of tabernacles, illustrating our salvation in completeness. The harvest rites of uh, the ceremonial system must therefore corroborate both the testimonies of the prophets and the parables concerning the harvest, for all are inextricably bound up together. The ceremonies of the first and the second fruits of grain must accordingly unfold the truth concerning the first and second fruits of humanity. Track number 3, page 75. So, there are three that had been mentioned by the shepherds Rod, by which the plan of redemption is completely illustrated concerning the significance of the wave ship, the wave loaves, and the feast of tabernacles. We know that the wave ship will occur on the Passover week, whereas the wave loaves, that would be on the day of Pentecost, and then the Feast of Tabernacles. So our subject must be concerning the wave ship, which is the Passover week, the wave loaves, which is the Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Here in track number 3, on page 76, let us read the statement. It says, Here we see commanded the observance of three harvest rites. Number one, the ceremony of the wave ship at the beginning of the first harvest. Second, the ceremony of the wave loaves at the close of the first harvest. And third, the feast of tabernacles at the close of the second harvest. Being typical, these two grain harvests with their three literal sacraments accordingly foreshadow two soul harvests with three spiritual rites, the first of which is the first fruits with wave sheep and wave loaves. Track number 3, page 76. The admonition given in track number 3, page 78, saying, It will be observed that the command regarding observance of the seven day Sabbath as well as that regarding observance of the yearly ceremonial feast is recorded in the 23rd chapter of Leviticus, verse 3. Care, therefore, must be exercised not to confuse the one truth with the other. Now, this reading is plainly telling us that the whole subject concerning the wave ship and the wave loaves and the feast of tabernacles is found in the whole chapter of Leviticus chapter 23. And we are admonished to exercise extra care so that the truth could not be mixed up to avoid being confused of one truth to the other truth. So let us carefully decipher this very important subject. Now let us focus first to the wave ship. And the ceremony of the wave ship is performed within the past of the week. Only in the past of the week. There is no ritual concerning wave ship on the day of Pentecost, neither on the day of atonement, neither on the feast of tabernacles or on the Feast of Trumpets. But this harvest rite concerning the offering of the wave ship is performed during within the Passover week. So, let us focus first to that feast, the Passover feast. 
We already read in Desire of Ages, page 77. It says, The Passover was followed by the seven days feast of unleavened bread. On the second day of the feast, the first fruits of the year's harvest, a sheep of barley was presented before the Lord. All the ceremonies of the feast were types of the work of Christ. The deliverance of Israel from Egypt was an object lesson of redemption, which the Passover was intended to keep in memory. The slain lamb, the unleavened bread, the sheep of first fruits represented the Savior. Or let us put Jesus Christ as He is all in all. Herein, I would like to read that statement in um, track number 8, saying that Jesus Christ, He is all and all. So, or in other words, Jesus Christ typify all, whether it pertains to the dead or whether it pertains to the living. It says here in track number 8, page 46, Wherefore, says Christ, I am the root and the offspring of David, and the bride and morning star. Revelation 22, verse 16. Bearing out that he is all and in all. Track number 8, page 46. But accordingly, our God completely revealed the plan of redemption step by step or gradually unfolded. In track number 3, page 85, it says, Wonderful indeed is the way in which God has worked out the plan of salvation and revealed it step by step as necessary. So that is a wonderful statement. That God revealed the plan of salvation step by step as necessary. The same with the statement in Patriarchs and Prophets. On page 373, God's work is the same in all time. Although there are different degrees of development and different manifestations of His power to meet the wants of men in the different ages, beginning with the first gospel promise and coming down through the patriarchal, and Jewish ages, and even to the present time, there has been a gradual unfolding of the purposes of God in the plan of redemption. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 373. And as the plan of redemption is revealed through the sanctuary construction and service, According to 2SR 187, saying, In the sanctuary construction and service is revealed the plan of salvation. So this very important subject, the wave ship and the wave lobes, brothers and sisters, the focal point is the occurrence in the heavenly sanctuary, not on the earthly sanctuary, which is only the type. The particular object in view is the antitype. That's why it says here in The Great Controversy, page 423, it says, let's read The Great Controversy, page 423. The subject of the sanctuary was the K, which unlocked the mystery of the disappointment of 1844. It opened to view a complete system of truth, connected and harmonious, showing that God's hand had directed the Great Advent Movement and revealing present duty as it brought to light the position and work of his people. And then, in the latter part, it says, Light from the sanctuary illumined the past, the present, and the future. The Great Controversy, page 120, 123. So, the particular object in view concerning the subject, the wave ship and the wave lobes, is centered to the proceedings in the heavenly sanctuary because that is the sanctuary of the Christianity. I would like to read 1 and 123 saying, The wilderness life is the symbol of the sanctuary question at the end of the 2,300 days. It was in the wilderness that the heavenly sanctuary was described by the earthly. 1 SR page 123. So it says, The wilderness life is the symbol of the sanctuary question at the end of the 2,000. 
300 days. It was in the wilderness that the heavenly sanctuary was described by the early. 1 SR page 123. Now let's go back again, brothers and sisters, to our main subject. The wave ship in the Passover week. Now, the statement in Desire of Ages, page 77, plainly declared that not only a part, but rather all the ceremonies of the feast, the Passover feast, were types of the work of Christ. Desire of Ages, page 77. But what work of Jesus Christ? His ministration in the heavenly sanctuary. For the Bible made it so plain that if Christ was on earth, he could not be a priest. Here in Hebrews chapter 8, this is the statement given by the word of God. It says, verse 1, Now of the things, chapter 8 in Hebrews, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. And then in verse 4, it says, For if he were on earth, if Jesus Christ were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. Or in other words, Apostle Paul is trying to emphasize that the priesthood of Jesus Christ is not on earth, but rather in heaven, the true sanctuary. So here in track number 3, it says here on page 85, Just as Christ and those whom he raised and took with him became the prototypical ship, betokening the ingathering of the first fruits, the 120 of those who are to be resurrected. So also when he entered upon his priestly ministration in the first apartment of the heavenly sanctuary, and presented himself and his trophies before his father, they became the antithetical ship, betokening the ingathering of the first fruits of those who are to be translated, the 144,000 living saints. In the light of this parallel, the spiritual condition of the 120 before the apostolic Pentecost is clearly seen to typify the spiritual condition of the 144,000 before the future Pentecost. Track number 3, page 85 and page 86. There are a lot of information given in this paragraph, brothers and sisters. But let us gradually decipher these very important statements. But in this reading, first of all, the statement in track number 8, page 46, can be applied that when Jesus Christ presented himself and his trophies before his father, it says they became the antitypical ship, betokening the ingathering of the first fruits of those who are to be translated, the 144,000 living saints. So, it is, brothers and sisters, um, pointing that Jesus Christ is all and in all. He covered all humanity. Although, in this study, it was illustrated by individual groups, brothers and sisters, as to typify the wave ship and the wave lobes. Now, in this study, since, according to track number 3, page 76, there are only two grains to illustrate the entire plan of redemption by which such two grains is the barley and the wheat. Now for sure, it is closely connected to the two grains in Revelation 6 verse 6 or the two cereals which is the barley and the wheat. Now let us read again the statement in 2 SR, page 234, saying, Why only two kinds of cereals brought to view? That is in Revelation 6, verse 6. And in Leviticus 23, there are also only two kinds of grains, and that is the wheat and the barley. Remember, in Testimonies for the Church, volume 6, on page 392, 
it says the gospel is given in precept in Leviticus. Implicit obedience is required now as then. How essential it is that we understand the importance of this word. And it is even more focusing to the entire chapter of Leviticus chapter 23. Now, here in 2SR 234, in saying, Why only two kinds of cereals brought to you? Why not five? The two cereals are sufficient to illustrate the thought and to clear the lesson. But the chief reason for only two is to draw attention to the first and last cause. Because reference is made up but two Israels, namely Israel after the flesh, the descendants of Abraham, and Israel after the spirit, the 144,000. But the object of the lesson is for the latter, who are hard at the eleventh hour. For the truth of the parable has never been understood by any other company. 2SR page 234. But I do fully believe that in Leviticus 23, as explained by the Shepherd's Rod, in track number 3, that the reason God uses only two classes of grains, according to track number 3, page 75, saying, The ceremonies of the first and the second fruits of the grain must accordingly unfold the truth concerning the first and second fruits of humanity. So the reason that God used only two classes of grains, barley and wheat, is to unfold the truth concerning the first fruits and the second fruits of humanity. We already read in track number 3, in Zeshi, page 82 and page 83. As the light focusing to this point clearly reveals that the Pentecost after the resurrection was for the ingathering of those who were to die, there must correspondingly be a Pentecost for the ingathering of those who are to be translated. And by the same token of logic, the wave ship and the wave loaves must have a double application each to the dead and to the living, together comprising the total fruits of the antitypical harvest. Track number 3, pages 82 and page 83. So, the shepherd's rod is very plain that the ceremonies concerning the wave ship and the wave loaves has a double application. Now, let us focus first to the ceremonies of the wave ship, which is, or let us um, study all the application concerning the wave ship. The application is double, both to the dead and to the living. Or in other words, the wave ship must be applied to the dead and the wave ship must be applied to the living. And that is pointing to Jesus Christ and those who have been resurrected on that day. But we need to distinctly separate those who have been resurrected together with Jesus Christ, 6 a.m., and those who have been resurrected after his resurrection in 9 a.m. Or in other words, although both of them were resurrected the same day, April 18, Sunday, but they were not resurrected the same hour. So those who had been resurrected together with Jesus Christ, meaning the same hour, Jesus Christ was resurrected, 6 a.m. But the Bible is very plain. There are also that had been resurrected after his resurrection. And we can apply the three hours interval, brothers and sisters, recorded in uh, 2SR. So here in Matthew chapter 27, it says here, on verse 53, and came out of the graves after his resurrection. Matthew 27, verse 53. Now let's go back to track number 3. It says here in track number 3, page 80, just as Christ arose on the very day the ship was to be offered, likewise the Holy Spirit fell upon the 120 disciples on the very day the wave globes were to be presented before the Lord. And it says, The Apostolic Pentecost 
was accordingly the prototype of the ceremonial Pentecost, the day the wave loaves were offered. And since the wave ship was a figure of Christ and of those who arose with him, so that was 6 a.m., as the first of the first fruits of the dead, hence the wave loaves were a figure of the 120 spirit-filled disciples who were the full complement of the first fruits of the dead and who were gathered in after the resurrection. Now, let us now distinctly separate those that have been resurrected by Jesus Christ together with His resurrection the same hour, 6 a.m., they are the first of the first fruits. But those that have been resurrected after His resurrection, they are the first fruits. So let us distinctly separate the first of the first fruits and the first fruits. Now, it is very important, brothers and sisters, to concentrate on the subject because according to the shepherd's word in page 75, it says, For all are inextricably bound up together. The word inextricably meaning uh, bound up together that nothing should escape our attention. So, Concerning these harvest rites, it was inextricably bound up together. And very important, brothers and sisters, that uh, we, would, we would follow this admonition in um, 2 Symbolic Code, number 7 and 8, page 10. 2 Symbolic Code, number 7 and 8, page 10, saying, Hence, as there are no useless words in either of the writings, let us apply that statement. Writings of Sister White and B.D. Hodder. There are no useless words. Hence, as there are no useless words in either of the writings, those who desire to know the truth must carefully mark every word. Otherwise, they will never comprehend the truth. And as a consequence, they will be driven by the winds as the wave of the sea until... The wind ceased blowing, probation closes, and they be left to sink down in their sins as do the waves in the sea. So, let us distinctly separate those who have been resurrected together with Jesus Christ, because according to track number 3, page 80, they were the first of the first fruits. So, they were the first of the first fruits, brothers and sisters. But those who had been resurrected after Christ's resurrection, they were the first fruits of the dead. Now, I would like to uh, read here in track number 3, page 85, saying, Just as Christ and those whom He raised, so they are those who have been resurrected after Christ's resurrection, not together with Christ's resurrection. Just as Christ and those whom He raised, meaning, after Jesus Christ was resurrected, because how could Jesus Christ resurrect them if Jesus Christ were still dead? Just as Christ and those whom he raised and took with him became the prototypical ship, betokening the ingathering of the first fruits, the 120 of those who are to be resurrected. Track number 3, page 85. Now, I would like to connect to you first the, the wave lobes. Then, let us go back to after connecting the wave lobes to the wave ship. Now, let us read track number 3, 1934 edition. Track number 3, 1934 edition, page 72. So, I would like to read the statement. Our attention is called to the fact. Our attention is called to the fact that the Pentecost after the resurrection is the pillar of the Old and New Testament church. For the names of the twelve apostles who received the Pentecost are written in the foundation of the city instead of the names of the twelve patriarchs or some others. Now, this statement is very important, brothers and sisters. Who are they, the twelve apostles, that received on the day of Pentecost? Can we enumerate one by one? Who are they, the twelve apostles, who received the Pentecost? According to this reading. Now, I would like to read it again. It says, Our attention is called to the fact that the Pentecost, after the resurrection, is the pillar of the Old and New Testament church. It is not the pillar of the Old Testament 
church only, but as well as the New Testament church. It is not the pillar of the New Testament church only, but as well as the Old Testament church. The Pentecost after the resurrection. And we know that that was June 7, 31 AD. And the shepherds had says, For the names of the twelve apostles who received the Pentecost. Who are they? The twelve apostles that received the Pentecost. It says, are written in the foundation of the city, the New Jerusalem. Now let us focus first. Who are they? The twelve apostles by which their names were written in the holy city as recorded in the Bible in Revelation 22. Now let us read the chapter 1, 2SR. Let us read the statement. 2SR page 77. Therefore, our intention in this chapter is to briefly visualize the lesson thought by her crown of 12 stars. We ask the question, who appointed these present-day self-styled apostles or apostolic authorities? And it says, it is said that after the apostle passed away, another set of the same number have a right to be apostles. Suppose the claim is true. There are hundreds of churches, and if each one of them had 12 apostles, there would be multiplicity of thousands of them at one time. And if that act had been repeated in every age, there would be an innumerable multitude of apostles at the appearance of Christ. If there have been thousands of apostles, it is evident by the following scripture that they shall never enter into the city of God as apostles. For inspiration says, And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the name of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Revelation 21 verse 14. What is the difference between an apostle and a minister of the gospel? If there is no difference, then there should have been more than 12 apostles in the early church. For there were more than 12 engaged in the ministry. Christ had appointed 12, but Judas was counted out, leaving only 11 after Christ ascended on high. The 11 agreed to appoint another in Judas' place, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Acts chapter 1 verse 26. Therefore, they made up the number. Now, if Matthias took Judas' place, then there must be thirteen such men according to Romans 1 verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Mark carefully that the woman's crown has only 12 stars, and in the foundation of the city, there are only the names of the 12 apostles. Which one of the two, Matthias or Paul, is not recognized by him who laid the precious foundation of the holy city? If we say Paul, we make him a liar. If we say Matthias, then his ordination by the eleven had no effect in appointing an apostle. What then? In the Acts chapter 1 verse 26 is the first and last we hear of Matthias, but not so of Paul. If Matthias is the apostle, then he surely is not as worthy as Paul. Which one of the ordinations would be most honorable? Is it Paul by Christ himself as he met him on the way to Damascus or Matthias by the hands of the apostles? The question is clear. No man's hand are qualified to ordain an apostle regardless of his high standing in connection with the gospel. The holy hands of Christ and his personal presence only can appoint one for such an office. This is an impeachable evidence for the woman has a crown of only 12 stars. Therefore, who has the power to ordain another and thus multiply? The stars. To us are page 77 and page 78. So, the shepherd's rod is plainly emphasizing that the last apostle is Apostle Paul that replaced Judas Iscariot. And remember, Apostle Paul was converted to Christianity after his conversion in Damascus. And that is after the stoning of Stephen because he himself, he is the one consented the death of Stephen. Now, brothers and sisters, the day of Pentecost was poured out in June 7, 31 AD. And at that time, Apostle Paul was not yet a Christian. Now, this is the question. 
Brothers and sisters, who are they, the 12 apostles, that received the Pentecost? Now, let's read again the statement. Track number 3, 1934, edition, page 72. Our attention is called to the fact that the Pentecost after the resurrection is the pillar of the Old and New Testament church. For the names of the 12 apostles who received the Pentecost, now on June 7, 31 AD, there are only 11 apostles. The rest, they are disciples, not apostles. The shepherds had made it so plain. There is no other 12 apostles except the 12 apostles by which the last apostle is Apostle Paul and not Matthias. Now, let us read again the statement here in track number 3, 1934 edition, page 72. Our attention is called to the fact that the Pentecost after the resurrection is the pillar of the Old and New Testament church. For the names of the 12 apostles who received the Pentecost, and since it cannot be denied that Apostle Paul is the last apostle, brothers and sisters, the 12 apostles by which their names were written in the foundation of the city in the New Jerusalem, one of those names must be Apostle Paul. So this statement cannot be construed that the Pentecost mentioned here is only pointing to that one Pentecost in June 7, 31 AD. And for sure, Apostle Paul being a part of the 12 apostles, he also received the Pentecostal power. Otherwise, he could not preach the gospel of Christ with power. But not the same year. It must be on 35 AD because he was converted on 35 AD. Brothers and sisters, so it must be in 35 AD. So in this reading, we can easily discern that the Pentecost in 31 AD is the pillar of the Old Testament church, but the Pentecost, when Apostle Paul received the Pentecost, the Pentecostal power, that is the pillar of the New Testament church. So there are two Pentecosts. The Pentecost during the 11 apostles as the pillar of the Old Testament church, the Pentecost to the last apostle, Apostle Paul, as the pillar of the New Testament church. So the wave lobes has a double application. What is wave lobes? That is offered on the day of Pentecost. It has a double application, both to the dead. Now concerning the dead, the first application is the Pentecost to the 11 apostles, and the second application is to the Pentecost to the last apostle, which is Apostle Paul. And since that is the pillar of the Old and New Testament, the shepherds rod declared clearly it is the light bearer on the subject. Here in track number 3, 1934 edition, page 73, it says, let us read, plainly then, there are three Pentecosts to be considered, two in the past and one in the future. The one after the resurrection being the bacon point and the true foundation of the church, also the only one historically recorded, it is the light bearer on the subject. So the Pentecost after the resurrection. But the fact is that there are two Pentecosts after the resurrection. The Pentecost during the 11 apostles, the Pentecost during the last apostle. Because that is the statement to the 12 apostles who received the Pentecost. If the only Pentecost is during June 7, 31 AD, then there must be only 11 apostles. Because Matthias is not a part of the 12 apostles. But rather it is Paul. And Paul was converted after the 490 years ended. The 490 years ended in October 1634 AD. And that is the stoning of Stephen. And Apostle Paul is the very one who consented the death of Stephen. And he was not converted to Christianity, not until after Stephen died. So the statement given by the Shem Persuad that it must have a double application both to the dead, the wave ship and the wave lobes. So, brothers and sisters, the application of the wave lobes to the dead on the day of Pentecost is divided into two. The first application, the 11 apostles. The second application is to the last apostle, which is Apostle Paul. Now, let us go back to our main subject first, the wave ship. Now, here in 
track number 3 on page 78. It's Asian, track number 3, page 78. Both the wave sheet and the wave lobes were tank offerings for the first fruits. One was dedicated at the beginning of the harvest and the other at the completion of it. In contrast to the wave sheet of cut stalks of grain, prefiguring fruits to be gathered after the sheep was offered. The wave loaves, being a finished product, signified fruits previously gathered. The reader who would best comprehend the significance of these three ceremonial celebrations, all important to our salvation, will follow the chart on page 77. It says, as we proceed. And we know that this is the chart, brothers and sisters. And Bible numerics is found in track number three. So let us see first the, the, the diagram. So that's, that is the chart. The ceremonial harvest and its significance. You see? So here the list of references. And here. So this is the entire chart concerning the ceremonial harvest, uh, brothers and sisters. And even in the chart itself, you can immediately discern that the focal point of the subject is the heavenly sanctuary because this um, chart by which there are four beasts and the lamp in the midst of them, then the 24 elders, and then God the Father sitting on the throne, it points out to the proceedings in the heavenly sanctuary. So the particular object in view in the subject is concerning brothers and sisters, the proceedings in the heavenly sanctuary. Now look at the uh, biblical numbers. 40 times 3 equals 120. 120 times 5 equals 600. 600 times 10 equals 6,000 years. Then it says 6,000 years, literal provisionary time. So in this subject concerning the subject, the wave ship and the wave lobes, the subject concerning the longest Bible time prophecy, 6,000 years, is here included. So there is no possibility that we could understand this subject unless we would have a clear conception concerning the 6,000 years prophecy. And the 6,000 years prophecy can never be understood unless the Bible calendar will be restored or unless we could have that knowledge concerning the Bible calendar. Now let us uh, go back to track number 3, page 78. The shepherd's rod says, Both the wave sheep and the wave lobes were tank offerings for the first fruits. So, the wave sheep and the wave lobes, according to the shepherd's rod, they were tank offerings. So, to have a uh, full knowledge concerning the tank offerings, of course, we will go to the book of Leviticus, also in Numbers. And let us distinctly separate the, the tank offerings, brothers and sisters, and also the tithes. Now, it says here, both the wave ship and the wave lobes were tank offerings for the first fruits. One was dedicated at the beginning of the harvest. So, the wave ship, it was dedicated at the beginning of the harvest. Whereas the wave lobes, it says the other, at the completion of it. Now, for example, if we would go directly, the particular object in view, the 144,000 living saints, the first fruit, the spiritual Israel, what is the significance of the wave ship? And what is the significance of the wave lobes? Both of them are tank offerings. So the reason that you will offer the wave ship before the Father is to give thanks for what? For the first fruits. Why is it that you give thanks? What happened to the first fruits? So it is even more focusing to the last generation of men, brothers and sisters. I think to give thanks is to praise God. Now, let us establish first this very important subject because all the subjects as a whole in the plan of redemption are closely connected to each other and they were in perfect harmony. Now, the statement in 2SR 187, I would like to read again that statement, saying, the seven seals in the sanctuary. So it is coupled together, one subject. The seven seals and the sanctuary. It says here, in order 
to make a proper application of the seven seals. So in order for us to make a proper application of the seven seals, we must have a better understanding of the heavenly sanctuary service, its origin, and the object of its existence as taught by the early sanctuary built by Moses. Hebrew, it's Hebrews chapter 8 verse 5. For in the sanctuary construction and service is revealed the plan of salvation. So brothers and sisters, if, if you will be studying a subject concerning the wave ship and the wave lobes, but in reality, you are in total darkness concerning the proceedings in the heavenly sanctuary, for sure, without any doubts, your understanding is erroneous. And it cannot be of God. Because the voice of inspiration says, unless we have a better understanding concerning the sanctuary service and construction. And brothers and sisters, if we will be studying the book of Revelation, that is studying the subject of the seven seals. In 2TG it says, number 12, the statement given here, page 25, and so when we speak of the seven seals, we are in reality speaking of the revelation. 2 TG 12.25 And so, when we speak of the seven seals, we are in reality speaking of the revelation. So, when we speak or study the seven seals, we are studying the book of Revelation. But the Shepherd's Word says, in 2 SR 7, you cannot understand the subject of the seven seals unless you have a better understanding concerning the proceedings in the heavenly sanctuary. And although there are some portion in the proceedings in the heavenly sanctuary that was illustrated by the services of the sanctuary in the days of Moses, but the shepherd's word says in 2SR 190, it says, Thus we see, 2SR 190, Thus we see that Paul is right, that the service of the heavenly was not fully manifested by the service in the early. I would like to read again to SR 190. Thus we see that Paul is right that the service of the heavenly was not fully manifested by the service in the early. It was not fully manifested. Or in other words, not all that pertains to the heavenly sanctuary, the proceedings in the heavenly sanctuary, had been manifested in the proceedings in the earthly sanctuary. There are many things that occurred in the heavenly sanctuary by which it was not manifested in the services on the earthly sanctuary built by Moses. But 100% all the manifestations of the services in the earthly sanctuary is found in the heavenly sanctuary. Because the statement in Desire of Ages, page 77, it says, All the ceremonies of the feast I pipied the work of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. Now, let us now um, focus our attention, brothers and sisters, to that statement in track number three. Focusing first to the wave ship. The wave ship is a tank offerings. Now, in connection with the proceedings in the heavenly sanctuary, the Lord being not the author of confusion, according to 1 Corinthians 14.33, God is a God of order. So, in order for us to comprehend clearly the plan of redemption, the term used by God to the dead in the heavenly sanctuary is presented, whereas the term used by God to the proceedings in the heavenly sanctuary that pertains to the living, God uses the word offer. So, the term offered applied only to the living, but the term presented is applied only to the dead. So, if it pertains to the dead, the term use is presented. But if it pertains to the living, the term use offered. Now, for example, here in 2SR, on page 220, 2SR page 220, note the words at the opening of the judgment for the dead in 1844, and when he had taken the book, the poor beast and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. Mark that no angel offered a prayer, but the prayers of the saints 
were presented by the beasts and elders through praise by harps and golden vials full of odors. That is, there was no prayer offered for the dead, but their prayers which they had prayed being recorded while they were yet alive were presented before the throne to us our page 220. So the term offer must be applied only to the living, not to the dead. And the term presented is applied to the dead and not to the living. Now, for example, here in, uh, let me read this reading. Uh, track number 3, page 76. Being of cut stocks of grain, the wave sheep signified fruits to be harvested. And as the sheep was to be offered before the sickle was put to the grain and gathered into sheaves, it obviously pointed forward to a spiritual harvest of first fruits to be gathered. Now, the term used here is, and as the sheep was to be offered. Now, how about this reading in Patriarchs and Prophets? 539. The Passover was followed by the seven days feast of unleavened bread. The first and the seventh day were days of holy convocation when no servile work was to be performed. On the second day of the feast, the first fruits of the year's harvest were presented before God. Barley was the earliest grain in Palestine. And at the opening of the feast, it was beginning to ripen. A ship of this grain was waved by the priest before the altar of God as an acknowledgement that all was his. Not until this ceremony had been performed was the harvest to be gathered. Patriarchs and Prophets 539. Going back again in Desire of Ages, page 77, it says, The Passover was followed by the seven days feast of unleavened bread. On the second day of the feast, the first fruits of the year's harvest, a sheep of barley, was presented before the Lord. All the ceremonies of the feast were types of the work of Christ. The deliverance of Israel from Egypt was an object lesson of redemption, which the Passover was intended to keep in memory. The slain lamb, the unleavened bread, the sheep of Persepolis represented the Savior. So both Desire of Ages, page 77, and Patriarchs and Prophets, 539, use the term presented before the Lord. Now, let us go back again to track number 3. On page 78, both the wave sheep and the wave lobes were tank offerings for the first fruits or were tank offerings for the first fruits. So the focal point is the first fruits. Why is it that there is a ceremony to wave before the Father, a sheep offering? It is to give thanks unto the Father. Why? Because the first fruits were already harvested. And the significance of waving the wave sheep before the Father in order that the harvested first fruits must be gathered. So let us distinctly separate the significance and the giving thanks. There are two significance of waving the wave sheep before God the Father. To gather the, the barley which was already harvested and at the same time, to harvest the wheat, which is already ripe. So that is the two significance of waving the wave ship before the Father, brothers and sisters. So, now let us read track number 3, page 76. It says, Here we see commanded the observance of three harvest rites. These three observance of harvest rites is applied to both, both grains, barley, and wheat. Or in other words, there are three harvest rites that pertains to the first fruits. There must be three harvest rites that pertains to the second fruits. Now let us focus first the three harvest rites that pertains to the first fruits. 144,000 is spiritual Israel, living saints, both in the earthly and the heavenly sanctuary. Because it is only, brothers and sisters, um, during the judgment that pertains to the living, that both sanctuary are thus affected. What is the judgment? Harvest. Track number 3, page 88. The judgment is the harvest, or the harvest is the judgment. 
And there are two harvests. Harvest that pertains to the dead and harvest that pertains to the living. 2 TG number 11, page 12 and 13. So let us read again the statement here in track number 3 on page 76. Here we see commanded the observance of three harvest rites. The ceremony of the wave ship at the beginning of the first harvest. So what is the ceremony of the wave ship? That is at the beginning of the first harvest. How about the ceremony of the wave loops? The ceremony of the wave loops at the close of the first harvest. So it's, it is very important to have a clear conception uh, of these harvest rites. And the last one, the third one, it says, The Feast of Tabernacles at the close of the second harvest. Now, I would like to use a simple illustration. This is a simple illustration. Wave ship. It says, this rites is at the beginning of the first harvest. Then, wave lobes. Close. So, the wave lobes, the significance of the wave lobes, the first harvest is close. And the beginning of the second harvest. So this is first harvest. This is second harvest. So the second harvest begins on the offering of the wave lobes. So the significance of the offering of the wave lobes. The first harvest is closed. The second harvest begins. What is the significance of the Feast of Tabernacles? The second harvest is closed. So that is Feast of Tabernacles. So I would like to repeat again. Three harvest rites. Three harvest rites. But these three harvest rites must be applied, brothers and sisters, to the first, to the first fruits. Therefore, the term second harvest, or the term first harvest and second harvest, no, it cannot be construed that the second harvest mentioned here is the great multitude which no man could number. Because this second harvest is a part of the first fruits. The the, the first fruits were illustrated by three harvest rites, wave ship, wave lobes, and feast of tabernacles. So to have a clear conception, brothers and sisters, the offering of the wave ship is pointing to the first harvest. What is harvest? Judgment. So the term first harvest here is pointing to the judgment, the first aspect of the judgment. Book work, answerer number 5, page 30. So, we could easily understand that the offering of the wave ship, brothers and sisters, the occurrence is in the heavenly sanctuary. And let us study closely, brothers and sisters. That is the first harvest. So, on the day of Pentecost, wave loops is a tank offering indicating that the proceedings in the heavenly sanctuary is closed. And since the proceeding in the heavenly sanctuary is closed, then begins the proceeding on the earthly sanctuary, the second harvest. What does it mean by harvest? Judgment. The second judgment. The first judgment is in heaven. The second judgment is on earth. And in the Feast of Tabernacles, the judgment on earth is closed, pertaining to the first fruit harvest. Now let us um, turn to another angle, brothers and sisters. So I would like to read another statement. In So let us connect to the subject, the 12 figurative months. So focusing first, uh, brethren, Concerning the 144,000 living saints is spiritual Israel. Who, who will gather the 144,000 living saints is spiritual Israel? Now let us read 2TG. Here in 2TG, number, I think number 44, on page 37, it says, Who gathers the first fruits? If the first fruits gather the second fruits, let us find our answer by reading Revelation 14, 14 to 19. But I will no longer read. You can read at your own leisure. I would like to read the commentary. Here we are again told that there are two reapings. One by the Son of Man and another by an angel. The reaping by the Son of Man precedes the reaping by the angel. The Son of Man therefore gathers the first fruits. Now, let us apply now the uh, subject wave ship and wave lobes. Who will gather the 144,000, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ Himself. Our brothers and sisters, it is Jesus Christ who will gather them. How about this reading in 1 TG number 15, on page 19 and page 20? In closing, I shall read from early writings in the chapter entitled, The Loud Cry. This message, that is the message that makes the loud cry, 
seem to be an addition to the third message. Joining it as the midnight cry joined the second angel's message in 1844, early writings, page 277. And on page 118, we read, I then saw the third angel, said my accompanying angel, Perfor, careful is his work. Awful is his mission. He is the angel that is to select the wheat from the tares and seal or bind the wheat for the heavenly garner. This thing should engross the whole mind, the whole attention. Whoever this angel might be, he could not be a human being. Because the statement in 2TG number 11, it says, uh, 2TG number 11 on page 5. Here we see, that even the ideas of the most faithful servants of God as to the setting up of his kingdom and the weeding out the tales are not the same as God's plans. This cleansing work belongs only to the angels of heaven and this they will do in the time of harvest after being commanded to do so, not before. So that is very plain. In testimonies to ministers, Page, I think page 47 saying that this work of separation is given to the angels of God and not committed into the hands of any man. PM page, 400, page 47, it says, The work of separation is given to the angels of God and not committed into the hands of any man. But there are two sections of separation. The first section, it is the wicked that had been taken out from among the righteous. The second section, it is the righteous that had been taken out from among the wicked. But in this statement, in 1 TG 15, page 19 and page 20, when it is the righteous that had been taken out from among the wicked, there is only one angel. But concerning the wicked taken out from among the righteous, there are more than one angel because the scripture says angels. The angels severe the wicked from among the just. Now, I think that is a commentary in Matthew 13, verse 49. It says, So shall it be at the end of the world. Matthew 13, verse 49. The angel shall come forth and severe the wicked from among the just. So it is more than one angel because it is inscribed in plural form. The angels will severe the wicked from among the just. According to... To the Bible itself, brothers and sisters. Let me see if I could find some statement in the same person. In track number 3, on page 42, let us read. It says, Judgment among the living. Track number 3, pages 42 and page 43. So let us read the statement here. Since this fair sum truth, as he revealed, finds its counterpart in Christ's parable of the wheat and the tails, the parables must necessarily therefore teach the investigative judgment among the living. So it says that the parables of Jesus Christ must necessarily therefore teach the investigative judgment among the living. Let both grow together, commands Christ in regard to the commingling of the wheat and tails until the harvest and in the time of harvest. I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, this parable of Jesus Christ in Matthew 13 verse 30, the one that had been commanded to gather the wheat into my barn is the angel mentioned in 1 TG 15 page 19. And the angel in the vision of the prophet in early writings 118. His divine commission is to gather the wheat into the heavenly garner. But there are angels by which the divine command given to them is to gather the tares. So let us distinctly separate the angels more than one by which their divine commission is to severe the wicked from among the just. To gather the tares. But concerning the wheat, there is only one angel. Now, here, brothers and sisters, if you will not distinctly separate the occurrence in heaven and the occurrence on earth, then you might be confused because the voice of inspiration says it is Jesus Christ who will gather the 144,000 living saints to TG44, page 37. 
as recorded in Revelation 14, verse 14 to 19. But in the vision of Sister White, it is the third angel. Early writings 118. For sure, the third angel mentioned there, first, it cannot be human being. Second, it cannot be Jesus Christ. But the fact is that, who are they the wheat? Here in 1SR 228, it says, The wheat represents the 144,000. The barn is a symbol of security. 1SR 228, the wheat represents the 144,000. The barn is a symbol of security. Who are they, the wheat? The 144,000 living saints, spiritual Israel, brothers and sisters. Now, who are they, the barley then? So, the mere fact that the shepherd's rod admonish us to exercise extra care in studying this subject so that we could not mix up the truth. First, the admonition given in track number 8 saying that we should carefully differentiate track number 8, page 5, so correctly to understand this prophetic event in its entirety, we must carefully differentiate the part which takes place in heaven from the part which takes place on earth. That is the only way that we will not be confused. Let us carefully differentiate the part which takes place in the heavenly sanctuary and the part which takes place on the earthly sanctuary. And we will show to you gradually that the wave ship is a tank offering at the beginning of the harvest. And the reason that, of course, the one who will give thanks, it is the human being. It is not God. And the focal point of this study must be pointing to the last generation of men, to the saints that will no longer to taste that, by which they need to give thanks to the Lord, praising His holy name, signifying the offering of the wave ship. What is the significance of the wave ship to give thanks to the Lord for the first fruits? Why? Why is it that they need to give thanks? What happened to the first fruits that is pertaining to the heavenly sanctuary? The saints, they need to give thanks to the Lord because the 144,000 living saints in the Lamb's Book of Life, their names were not blotted. The only names that have been blotted are the tales, brothers and sisters. That is the first tank offerings. And the second tank offerings, which is the ceremonies of the wave loops, the Pentecost, still because of the first fruits, or brothers and sisters. What is the significance? Because the first fruits, brothers and sisters, is already gathered into security, put into one place, the barn, the safe place. What is the barn in the heavenly sanctuary? The Lamb's Book of Life, sealed with seven seals. Now, I would like to illustrate to you, talking about the seven seal, the last section of the seven seals. Seventh seal, the congregation among the living. For example, this is the congregation among the living. Congregation of the living. And this is the names. This is the example. Now, when the ceremony of the wave ship is offered to give thanks for the first fruits, that is the statement in track number three, to give thanks for the first fruits. Why? Because the first fruits, their names were not blotted. Or in other words, when they give thanks offering for the wave ship, the blotting of names were already finished. Then the next ceremony is wave lobes. Wave lobes, brothers and sisters. What does it mean? This second ceremony. Because the names of the 144,000 were already inscribed into the barn. What is the barn? The Lamb's Book of Life sealed with seven seal. I would like to use the term because this is seven seal. Lamb's Book of Life sealed with the seven seal. This is Lamb's Book of Life. Lamb's, Lamb's Book of Life, brothers and sisters. Lamb's Book of Life. But this is not sealed with seven seals because God will not seal this book because there are names of the wicked. It is a mixed multitude. And those names... Brothers and sisters were not that were not blotted, their names were inscribed in this book. Once your name will be inscribed into this book, it is forever there. It will no longer be erased. You are eternally secured. And that is the ceremony of the wave loads. What is the ceremony of the Feast of Tabernacles? Brothers and sisters, 
That is the completion of the second harvest. The way blobs completion of the first harvest. Feast of Tabernacles is the completion of the second harvest. Right? And we are talking first the heavenly sanctuary, brothers and sisters. So the ceremony of the Feast of Tabernacle, meaning after the Day of Atonement is finished, all the names of the wicked are completely blotted out, then this is the ceremony of the Feast of Tabernacles, meaning the, the book in the heavenly sanctuary is completely cleansed. That is the last Day of Atonement. All the names of the wicked were completely blotted out, and only the names of the righteous had been left, then those names that had been left, of course, there is a great joy. Because the Feast of Tabernacles is a great rejoicing. It is still a long study, brethren, but we need to patiently, uh, carefully study the Word of God. Now let me read to you track number, number 3 on page 81, on page 82, track number 3. As the wave ship and the wave lobes are typical, then also the Feast of Tabernacles must be typical. Otherwise, the ceremony would not have been observed as a part of the harvest rite. And as in the type the feast was to be celebrated at the close of the final ingathering of the year's harvest, then correspondingly, in the antitype, it must be celebrated at the close of the final ingathering of the earth's harvest, which is nearing its fulfillment. So the time consumed in producing and in offering the wave ship and the wave lobes, also in observing the Feast of Tabernacles, is representative of the entire spiritual harvest time of the living and of the dead. So... That is very plain, brothers and sisters. Representative of the entire spiritual harvest time of the living and of the dead. According to this reading in track number 3, page 81. Now, I would like to connect again the statement in um, track number 3 on page 54. It says here, The four seasons of the year, all being required in completing the process of planting, raising and harvesting the year's crops, and autumn being the beginning of the agricultural year, just as the close of the summer season is the feast of ingathering, which is in the end of the year, when thou hast gathered in thy labors out of the field. Exodus 23 verse 16. This parable, therefore, illustrates by the 12 months of the year a period of gospel history in the closing of which the kingdom of Christ is to be set up and the beginning of which is the seed sowing time. There being a period of church history illustrated by this 12-month harvest period, we must therefore find the time of its beginning, the time of seed sowing, and the time of its closing, the time of reaping. So, the shepherds had plainly told us that the parable illustrate, illustrates by the 12 months of the year. 12 months of the year. It did not say 12 months of a year as indefinite article. But the article used is definite. Illustrates by the 12 months of the year, a period of gospel history. So, that is very plain. I would like to give you an example. For example, brothers and sisters, in general term, um, October 16, 457 BC ended in October 16, 34 AD. This is the entire 490 years, right? The 70 weeks. 70 weeks times 7 days equals 490 days or 490 years. But this is seems it is illustrated by 12 figurative months. From October to October, right? So, October, then November, December, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October. So, of course, October 16, November 16. So, from October 16, November 16, so this is 30 days. So, this is the first 30 days. One, two, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, ended into October 16. So, 490 years is 12 figurative months. So, the subject 12 figurative months is a very broad subject. 
But I'm giving you an example, brothers and sisters, that this subject, 12 figurative months, is illustrated also by the 490 years. As a matter of fact, that is... Brothers and sisters, the the divine principle of Jesus Christ. Because in the Bible, when one of the apostles asked, For how many times will I forgive my brethren that trespass against me? Is it seven times? Can you project that verse in the Bible? And Jesus Christ says, no, it must be 70 times or 70 times. 70 times seven. So that is the divine principle. The boundary line is 70 times 7, right? Um, Matthew 18, 22. It says, Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until 7 times, but until 70 times 7. Matthew 18, verse 22. And would you think, brethren, that um, if you will uh, look at from 1530 AD, 1530 AD, 1530 AD plus 490, you will fall in 2020, this very year. And we will explain to you what is the significance. From 1530 AD plus 490, you will fall in 2020. And it is closely connected to the subject, uh, the trumpet study, brothers and sisters. So the subject concerning the wave ship and the wave lobes is a very broad subject, brothers and sisters, by which it is connected to Revelation 6, verse 6. Now, let me read to you this uh, statement in track number 15. Because it is a part of the subject, the ceremonial harvest, the 6,000 years, right? Now, let us read. Um, track number 15, page 50. And it is under the symbolization of the port seal. Port seal, right? Seven seals and seven days. There is a close connection, brothers and sisters, in the creation week. Now, let us read the statement here in track number 15, page 50 and 51. The truth concerning the port part of the earth, over which power was given unto them to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth, is easily discovered. Dividing 6,000 the years from creation to the commencement of the millennium into four equal parts gives 1,500 years, the part in the end of which time the power was to wane. Again, it being true, that the slaying of the saints began with the crucifixion of Christ, this fourth part of the earth, therefore began at that time and ended with the Augsburg Confession, a document compiled by Luther and presented at the Diet of Augsburg to the Emperor Charles B. in 1530, exactly 1,500 years after the resurrection of Christ, considering that the Christian era is three and a half years predated the time the Roman power did wane. The shepherd says, we are talking about Hebrew calendar, not Gregorian, not Julian. And that is the reason why the shepherd says in 1SR, let me read to you again. Here in 1SR page uh, 116, it says, we may suppose the 390-year period began in about 1580 when Luther found the Bible and ended in 1890 AD, where the 40-year be period began, which would end in 1930. However, we cannot point out the exact day or month or even the year because we do not know the exact day of the call of Luther. And second, prophecy deals with the Jewish or perhaps the Hebrew year. The same with the statement in 2SR. The 508 AD mentioned there, let us read. To SR page 133, it says, To ascertain the prophetic time when the seventh day Sabbath, the daily and the truth, the sanctuary, were trodden underfoot, and Sunday observance with its pagan priesthood set up in their stead, it would be necessary to subtract 1,335 years from 1844, which would point back to 508 AD, dealing with the Hebrew calendar. So, Bible time prophecy must be reckoned with the Bible calendar, creation calendar. Now, for example, April 16, 31 AD, Bible calendar. April 16, 31 AD. And in Julian calendar, that is May 5. You see that May 5, 58 AD? May 5, 58 AD. This is Julian calendar. Bible calendar, April 16, 31 AD, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Let us add 1,500 years. Then, you will fall in Bible calendar, April 16, 1531 AD. 
But in Gregorian calendar, that was already October 12, 1536 AD, brothers and sisters. Now let us add April 16, 1531 AD, 490 years. So you will fall, brothers and sisters. April 16, 2021 AD, Bible calendar. And in Gregorian, it was October 10, 2019. It was already finished. The 490 years, the divine principle that was given by God. What does it mean, brothers and sisters? So we will continue this subject. And uh, to repeat again, brothers and sisters, there must be antitypical 490 years. And what is the 490 years, brothers and sisters? In the time, that is the last years that was given by God to the Jewish church. And who are they, the antitypical Jewish church? The Seventh-day Adventist church. Therefore, the allotted time by which God declared that God will spew them out of his mouth, which is the Jewish church, it was already in the past, October 10, 2019. We are now 2020, my dear brothers and sisters. So we will continue this subject and hoping that the good Lord would help us and will give us more zeal, courage, and living interest as we proceed in investigating the interplan of redemption from the heavenly sanctuary to the earthly sanctuary. Thank you very much and have a beautiful, wonderful evening.